Hello guys, welcome back to another episode of the Absolute Podcast. I'm your host, Jasmine Templin, online coach, personal trainer, bikini competitor pro. And I am so excited about today's podcast episode because we have an amazing guest. We have the beautiful Ida Shabans. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so a little bit about Ida. For those who don't know, I have been working with Ida myself for quite a few years now. She has helped me buy two properties we just brought the second one together so Ida can you tell us a little bit about who you are what you do how you've become the amazing you know successful self-made millionaire property uh expert that you are so just tell us all about yourself what you do who you are and let the audience know everything about you (laughs) okay all right so um I started off my career when I was just 19 But before I sort of go into the person that I am today, which you've kind of led people into knowing that I'm obviously very well adversed in the property game, but I actually was born overseas. So I was born in a place called Iran and my family and I left the country when the Shah got kicked out and the country changed. So we actually moved um, heading for Australia. I lived in Thailand for about a year and then following Thailand, I moved to Sydney, then to Brisbane and then back to Sydney. Um, and kind of all over the place at the moment with work and and, and lifestyles. But uh, the reason I tell you a little bit about my background, because I feel like it's super important because people always say, you know, did your parents, were your parents in property? How did you get into it? But I'd really like people to understand I had no parents in, in property, no parents in business, um, had no one like that when I was younger. So it was all just through, I guess, the adversity that I've lived. So Growing up, my childhood was extremely unstable. I was spending, you know, a lot of time from safe house to safe house. And that's when you're in a sort of domestic violence situation. And and, um, I was picked up from school and police cars. So I had a lot of instability growing up. And the reason why I tell you that is because when I tell you that I tried to move out of home as fast as possible, I actually moved out of home when I was 16 and I became my own legal guardian. So I went um, to school myself. I put myself through school, through uni and everything. So basically, I grew up extremely fast. So when I tell you a little bit about that and not going into all those details about my life and my life history, it makes sense why I've achieved so much at a young age because I was basically, I was forced to grow up really quickly. And for me, um, growing up, Uh, not speaking English and having family members and my mom especially that couldn't communicate or speak English I experienced growing up a lot of I guess racism Mm. and for me as a young person I sort of really attached that to not being able to communicate or not being educated in the English language so that was like I guess a big milestone for me because from that point on I just made it like for myself, I was, I have to know everything, be completely educated, be the smartest, and and then no one will hurt me, right? So education became really important and communication became really important. Fast forward from there, um, growing up, um, I then went to school by myself and then from school, living at a home, I went to uni and I studied business management at school and then I loved marketing. So with my background in marketing and also loving property, I initially went to look out for jobs in property marketing. So for property marketing at as an 18-year-old or while you're at uni, there's only like cadetships on offer. Mm-hmm. So that means you work your ass off for like very little money mm-hmm. and you're doing crazy hours. Um, At the same time, I got offered an opportunity in finance, um, which was all commission only, no salary, no no security, and but the sky's the limit, right? So for me, I saw that as a bigger opportunity for me to start in the industry because I know who I am and I know that if you give me a goal, this is very similar to you, Jasmine, and you tell me this is what you do, I'll just go do it and I'll smash it. And then I'll be like, next, and then go yeah. do it and I'll smash it. <laughs> yeah. So I did that. I started off my career in finance. I was teaching um, people about cash flow, money management, and how to own assets. So that was my beginning. 
Um, from there, I was offered a opportunity to have my own license under a mortgage management company. So I was doing wholesale funding. So basically we were our own bank in our own right. So what that means is like, CBA, Westpac, ANZ, they're all just a brand. Mm. The money all comes from private money and perpetual and wholesale funding. So we were our own brand under another brand where we were lending. So I've learned everything there is to know about money and banking and finance. So that was all my upbringing, like from 18. Mm. From 19, um, I wanted to buy my first property. So I entered the property market at 19. I just under 19, but I bought my first property and then um, it was an investment property. I never lived in my properties and then I bought another property using the equity and then I kept doing this. I started doing um, renovating, then I started doing developing. So my first property was a one bedroom unit off the plan. Second property was a two bedroom. Third property was a shit house in a really good area and so on and so on. So I built a really big portfolio while I was building my businesses, okay? But I just started as soon as I could and then I leveraged. The biggest thing for me was I didn't live in any of my properties till I think it was the third or the fourth property, fourth property. And then when I did move into the property, I actually was like, oh, my God, this is so dumb. I don't need this house. Like I'm just by myself. Like what am I doing? <laughs> So I rented out the house back then for like $1,000 a week. This is a long time ago. And then I just went into a one-bedroom unit and rented. So I'm like the pioneer example of rent vesting. You know, I was rent vesting before it was a thing. And and for me, the re and I never saw, and people would be like, rent is so dead, rent money is dead money. And I'd be like, nah, mate, because I own three properties, right? And how many do you have, yeah. right? So it's all about what you do. And this all comes through with the background in finance. So I was building my investment portfolio while I was building my property portfolio. And then I started having clients asking me, how do you do it? So then my business expanded into buyers agencies and then from their project sales and project management and property management and development. So now I have a number of companies under the Grow Group banner where we offer all of the different areas that people need. And for me, now I have a property portfolio worth well over $10 million. I hit that when I was 30. And then from now, I'm just developing. So I develop a lot of property and I help a lot of people invest and build wealth. So my passion is that my background, you know, I was born not into something like that had money. I was born with a lot of adversity, a lot of problems, but I made my own life and I created my own independence. And I want to help other people see that they're capable. Like there's actually no reason why you can't. It's only what you're willing to do, right? So that's just a little brief on me. <laughs> oh, I love it. I just love it story so much. And then even having done so many of your seminars and everything that you have done before, it's even amazing when you have shown like the examples of, you know, your first few properties that you've had versus like nowadays. It's so, so inspiring because it's not just like, you know, you grew up in like an average neighborhood it's like no you were you defied all the odds in terms of what your upbringing has been so it's honestly just an incredible story just to watch but moving forward into my next question with you know over 20 years of experience with property finance what are the most important things that first time buyers should know before making their first investments yes very good (laughs) great question (laughs) Um, people will probably think I'm going to talk numbers here, but the biggest number one important thing is mindset, right? So your money mindset needs to be right. And a lot of people without going into detail have limiting beliefs around money. And so if you go into any investment with a limiting belief, meaning a negative mindset that you don't deserve it, you can't do it, it's not possible, it's going to not work, then pretty much it ain't going to work for you. So the mindset piece, and, you know, I run a lot of um, different, I've got a lot of different programs on this, but this is one of the first things I talk to clients about. So getting your mindset around money will help you in your life. I would say the next part is like your budget and affordability, right? So do you actually understand where your money's going right now and how much money you've got available, okay? That's outside of what the bank will lend you. That's 
truly what can I afford without having stress? You know, yes, sometimes you have to cut things back, but, you know, you don't want to cut like food and things like that out. And then your affordability around what you can buy from the bank, finding that out. And then I would say the right guidance and support. You know, this is the biggest investment decision, one of the biggest things you'll buy in your life. And I still don't understand why people believe they can do it on their own. Like that just mind blows me. You don't do your own accountant, like your your tax return. And And that's like, (laughs) exactly, exactly. (laughs) You don't go and buy your, like, generally when you buy your first car, you get everyone, you know, to help you. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, when I say right guidance, this is people that are where you want to be and that have actually done it successfully. This is not asking friends and family members. I mean, unless they're doing extremely well in real estate, everyone's going to have an opinion. The reason why I say not not asking your parents necessarily, it's good to speak to them, even get them to go to the meetings with you like you did. (laughs) Um, But in this case, why I'm saying it is because the landscape of buying property or investing is so different today as it was when our parents were buying. When our parents were buying property and and the values of property and the mindset was you buy a massive house on a half acre block and you just own the one property and pay it off for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. That's based on the knowledge and education they had at the time. Now that we have more education, more knowledge, why would we not do different things differently? So that's what I mean by the guidance. Yeah, hundred percent. And I couldn't agree more because it's, you know, I'm, you and I, I know you're the same, just such big advocates for having like a mentor for you and I being mentors in our own fields. We just know how important and how powerful it is and how much offer we value we offer in our own industries and how much value it is. So it's like, why wouldn't we get a mentor in an area that we aren't experts in? So for me, you know, investing in you and like having you as my mentor through all of this, it's just, it's a no brainer because like, obviously it's so much money that, you know, you're wanting to invest and you know what you're starting to do and whatnot it's like you don't want to be making the wrong mistakes with that because you know it's not just a small mistake you know you're having that right mentor and like yourself for me like it's it would be stupid of me to not go with you (laughs) so and as you've helped me you know with the two properties in like two years that it's been um just made it so seamless so to anyone who hasn't even thought, because I think it was well, a lot of people probably don't even think that it's an option to even, you know, work with like a property or a finance expert. And especially with Grow Group that does everything for you. I feel like a lot of people, as soon as they hear what you guys do, it's like, oh, it's exactly what I need. I yeah, love- look, when you're talking about mentorship or guidance or why people don't, it's like, you know, what you're doing is you're actually fast tracking your success right Mm -hmm. so I know with you you're like it's funny because I actually use you for training so this is like really good you're my coach yes yes I know like from you know reversing it into the fitness world I don't I'm not like absorbed in it this is not what I do every single day I'm Mm -hmm. not up to date with what's you know what are the best things to do for your body like I wouldn't have a clue like I remember I've been you know at my age I've trained at many different times many different gyms personal train but things are always changing and I'm always changing right Mm -hmm. so for me having a fitness coach like yourself enables me to understand what I need to do with the time that I have to get the best result so it's all result driven And like, for me, it's the same thing. It's like, what are you trying to achieve? You know, tell me where you want to be, what you're trying to achieve. And then I'll also tell you that's really unrealistic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let's set realistic timeframes. Let's set realistic goals. And this is what we can achieve. And this is the best plan for you, right? It's exactly the same, except people just, I think, they either don't know that that's possible in the property and finance world um, because they've been told, like, I guess maybe they're not, doing any investigation or they're told by a lot of people they do go see that like just come and see me when you have the money right yeah 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 amazing and for someone who has worked with so many first time home owners what would be some of the most common mistakes that you see being done and how can they be avoided common mistakes would be cash flow right 
not knowing your numbers on what you can truly afford before you go into it, right? Because like you can take two people with the same income, right? But they have completely different lifestyles, Mm -hmm. right? Now, the bank's only going to look at what your income is and what your expenses are based on your income should be. But you might be going and spending all your money on holidays and doing all these crazy things that the bank can't see. For some reason, it's on another account. So like you go in and you buy something that was above your budget and real affordability. So that's when people sell properties at the wrong time and lose money. If you ever ever hear about people losing money, it's because they sold the property at the wrong time. You actually should never be, like you can't really lose money on any property in the long term. It's all timing. The other mistake is short-term thinking, right? Because we live in a social age, and I'm finding this is getting worse and worse, we're so used to instant gratification. Property is not instant gratification. It's just not. So you can't expect because we're reading all these things about this person made this money, that. That's great if that happens to you, but you need a long-term mindset when it comes to property. Minimum, minimum, absolute minimum, you need to hold a property for five years. That's the absolute minimum. I would say 10, but, you know, five years because I know people are just not able to get their head around these 10. Um, The other thing that most people make mistakes on, so let's say that they've bought the property, they're going through the finance process, They don't realize the other expenses associated with buying, right? Mm -hmm. Stamp duty, legals, adjustments at settlement, like for body corporate rates, solicitors fees, all of these extra costs. Sometimes, depending on who you work with, they're good. They'll tell you these things, but some people won't. And so I've had a lot of situations where people have called me and they're like, we can't settle. Not ones that I've done, but like asking for help right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, you didn't know that these costs were, you know, so yeah, Yeah. you need to deposit, then you need an extra three to 5% for those costs, depending if you're a first home buyer or not. So understanding all of the expenses associated with purchasing is super, super, super important. The other mistake people make, or two other mistakes real quick, they buy something old, not realizing the expenses associated with that property. So, for example, people say, oh, a unit has body court fees. So what? A house has maintenance. The difference is that body corp is you putting money away towards the ongoing maintenance of the facade and the building and everything like that. On a house, if you don't put money away, these expenses just smash you and you got like the roof. Uh, hot water system blows. Like I've bought old properties before and I can because I know I've got the funds to do it. But like literally the day I've settled, the hot water system, three and a half grand, leaking roof, air con, like all of these things happen. And as a first home buyer, you might probably don't have the money to fix it. So buying old as your first property can be a pretty big headache unless you're really ready and prepared for it. And then the other one would say trying to get rich quick. You know, the number of people that come to me and say, hey, um, I want to renovate, I want to do this, I want to do a split of block, I want to develop, and I'm like, but you haven't even bought one property? Like, you really need to just buy a property, get the experience. Like, trying to do these things that I see advertised on Instagram, oh, you don't have to do this, you can now be a developer, you can get other people's plan. That is so advanced, and that is a really quick way to lose your money. So I would just say, just be weary and and try to like go a little bit slower to get there. Time does fly. So just be weary of trying to like do the do the maximum gain in the shortest amount of time as your first investment. Yeah, incredible. And yeah, I love that so much. Moving forward into our next question. How would you say the investment property and finance landscape changed over the course of your career? And how have you adapted to these changes over that time? Oh, it's changed so much in 20 years. So I'll go property, sorry, I say property landscape. I guess um, it's getting affordability, right? So it's getting harder and harder for people to get in to the market. And that's because the prices are, are increasing. So if you're living in a capital cities or any of our biggest cities like Brisbane, um, so Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, 
Perth even, Western Australia, property prices everywhere are increasing. So as the prices increase, right, unless our income is increasing at the same rate, you're going to start seeing gaps in affordability. So I've seen um, capital growth and areas like Brisbane really like start flourishing as we've seen. Now we're going to have the Olympics there. Um, I would say the type of dwellings that people buy. So as our demographics changes on how we live, so less people having kids, we don't need bigger properties, we're living more on our own or as couples without kids. So the type of properties are changing, right? We're seeing that change and shift. We're seeing more density. We're seeing little cities popping up in suburbs, like you've got mini cities in different areas because people, the time of travel, it's all about transport and and um you know we've seen things around rail tra railways bus stations it's all about convenience so that's all the changes finance landscape um it's always a loop right so with the finance and banking world you always see funding tighten meaning it gets harder to borrow and then funding ease and that's just based on the cycle so as you know, as um, they need to get more people to buy, lenders will loosen their um, policies, interest rates will go down. And then as things get tougher, interest rates will go up and then they'll tighten their policies, reduce. So it's all risk based. But if you just understand with the banking and finance world, that market is cyc cyclical. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, cyclical, yep. meaning it just, it just shifts and changes. So what I always say to people is, and I've said this to you, oh, we're now entering a, a, a more difficult phase in funding. In six months, it'll be different. In a year, it'll be different. It just, it's just timing, you know? And if you can get the timing right, then it's great. But sometimes you just need to be aware of that it's not forever. And we can talk about that in one of your a little bit later if you if you want uh, yeah totally definitely and can you share some examples of some successful investment strategies that you've seen work well for first-time buyers and what was it that made them successful yep um I think you're one of my success stories oh, definitely <laughs> Bless, thank you um I think I think the biggest success stories have come for me when clients have looked at purchasing at at times when other people were scared. So it's, you know, that is the low of the market, right? So, you know, if I talk about, you know, any financial crisis, any time the media is heavily like saying how property is going to bust, um, you know, COVID was a good example where no one really knew what was going to happen. Personally, you know, being in, being in the industry for so long, eventually things would have worked out. And for me, that time was an opportunity mm. clients that understood and they weren't affected with their jobs like yourself were able to take advantage of that and what happens is is the market and the prices were really low mm. so anybody that was able to take advantage of that opportunity with the right mentorship could have obviously bought at a really low time and made a high so Buying at that at the right time in the right place, because obviously all of Australia works in different cycles with the property market. And then also looking at the off the plan. So off the plan strategy, and that's when you're buying a property before it's built and then you're waiting for it to be finished before you get the loan and settle. That could be one year, two years, or up to even five years, right? Why that's good for an for a first-time investor is that. You only need 10% deposit at that time. You secure it. Then if you've got a year or two years, you can save more money. You can save more money. So that is the biggest one. So I've had first-time buyers put down 10% and then by the time it's settled, they've had another 10%. So they actually end up having 20%. Not only that, my other off the plan is if you've got the right resources around you and the right people like myself, we get access really early. Mm. before it goes on the market before it goes to retail meaning anyone can access it publicly we get the first access that is when the prices are the lowest and the developers will generally put the pricing up once it goes to retail okay so that there could be 10 or 20 percent saving in price at that time and then if you've got the market and you buy at the right time potentially can make an increase on that property. So for example, I'll just use 
your do you want to use your example yeah, go for it. Uh, go yeah, for it. yeah. so we purchased in a um in in the gold coast for uh 650 45 or yeah. six, something like that <laughs> yes yeah, so around 650 and it was two bed two bath one car in freaking awesome location great developer beautiful quality finishes 10% deposit and that was one year one year ago got to settlement bank valuation was at 800 yeah 800,000 so you can see 650 to 800 150,000 gain on bank valuation which is generally lower than market and then the rent also so it was 6 650 we appraised at the high yeah. end and we're looking at probably 750 to 800 a week on yeah. the rent so you know, that's an incredible example of how you can get equity in a short amount of time, but it's timing, right? Whether it's 10,000, 20,000, 100, 200,000, making a gain, you didn't even get a loan till it was built. So that that was pure gain with no no interest or anything payable. So I think that you and I've got thousands more examples, including my own, that's exactly what I did. I bought one bedroom, settled, it was worth more, used the equity, bought my next one. Mm. So that for me is a really good strategy, but I will say you have to know your shit. I would not do this on your own because you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know what finishes. You, you don't know who the builder is. So that is super important that you use someone that is really well experienced in purchasing off the plan because you can also make mistakes. Mm, definitely I love that thank you for sharing and what advice would you give to someone who is considering investing in property for the first time but is unsure about the current state of the market is there a right time uh what should they be looking at <laughs> heaps of things um <laughs> generally I would say for me like 20 years I've seen everything I've seen GFC flooding fires COVID I've been through all of the different yeah. you know, turmoil that you could expect. The right time to buy a property is when you feel you can afford it and you're ready with your mindset to hold no matter what because there is always opportunity in the market. There's always opportunity. So it just comes down to how much you can borrow, how much you can afford. So, for example, you know, what I look at is, if, for example, the person's um, affordability or deposit is too low, I will tell them, to save potentially for a bit longer so they can buy a better quality property, okay? So there's like a bit of a balance. But when you're deciding if it should, it's the right, well, it's right when you are ready, okay? When you are ready, there's always opportunity if you have the right people to find the opportunity. Yeah, I love that. And regarding, I guess, location as well for certain clients, how is that? depending on the market timing is it different from cycle to cycle like how does how would one even decide what location obviously there's you that would help with that but um you know compared to just buying in like a family small suburb versus city like is there pros and cons I like, mean you know people say apartment versus house like could you yep. share some insight regarding the difference in pros and cons yeah, so for me, I would say um, it's not about house versus unit. It's about supply versus demand, right? It's like you need to know where the highest demand is for types of properties and buy within that. And that's why we're looking at apartments. Well, that's why we did apartments for you. At the moment, it's high blue chip, blue chip suburbs being, you know, sort of within 15 Ks of a CBD, right? So location is really, really important. And ticking off all those boxes, so amenity, cash flow, design, you know, opportunity for growth, infrastructure. So these are the most important things and understanding the demographics. So as I said, you know, at the end of the day, if this is an investment property, even if it's not, at some point you're either going to sell it or you need to rent it if you're changing properties, okay? Mm -hmm. So you want to find the properties that are most desirable and in highest demand. That's how you make the most money on property. That's how you make the highest yield in property. So, you know, breaking down those things around amenity, it's like location to transport, schools, parks, beaches, all of these type of things is important. 
And then you're looking at, you know, the macro being like the public schools, um, what else is in the area? It's walkability as well, you know, uh, employment, how close is it to employment nodes, uh, cash flow, how much does it cost you? What are your out-of-pocket expenses? Design, how unique is the design, the layout, the floor plan? All of these things is what we look at. But the biggest thing is, is, things change so COVID changed the way people want to live in property right more people work from home being mindful of that you can look at properties that provide co-working spaces or workspaces you can have studies NORC study areas so, so looking at how people live in a property is also super important yeah, I love that that's amazing and I know a lot of listeners on this podcast would be PTs, self-employed, what are some tips you could give us for the self-employed person looking to get a loan? Because I know it can be a little bit tougher on uh, needing a few years of tax returns for self-employed people. So could you give us any tips regarding getting loans? Yeah, I I speak to so many people that are self-employed that have been knocked back so many times, but because no one will actually tell them what to do. So the biggest thing is, is if you are a self-employed, the biggest thing is that you need to show income, right? Your accountant will do his job or her job by trying to avoid tax by not showing much income, but that doesn't help you build wealth. So if you want to buy a property, you need to understand how much are you looking to buy a property for? What income would you need to show? Okay. And then making sure that you are aiming for that income after tax so what's the taxable income right not what your gross revenue is not how much money you put in sales but how much after expenses can the bank use towards servicing a loan so the biggest thing is is as soon as you get into business or if you already are in business sit down with an expert and this is something that our team can do to tell you how much you need to show then you can plan for the property. And that's what we did, right? You're like, I want to get in. I was like, well, you need to do this. And then you were like, okay, cool. And then you need to do this. So it's having a plan, but being okay with paying tax, right? If you don't want to pay tax and you don't want to show income, then it's going, you're going to need to have a really, really large deposit and go down the low doc, no doc path, which you need about 25 to 30%, plus you pay higher interest rates. But on paper, you need to show two years under that ABN and two years tax returns, right? That's the biggest thing. You can, once you've got that income in the two years, you can, you can then you fall under the same rules, 5%, 10% deposits yeah. with mortgage insurance. Amazing. Awesome. And in your experience, what are some of the most important factors that first home owners should first-time buyers I should say should consider when choosing a property to invest in I know we chatted a little bit about this before regarding location but what are some other factors uh that they should look at in terms of uh when choosing a property to invest in what should they be looking uh, at yeah 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 Again, I think I've sort of covered it, true affordability, location and the type of asset that you're buying and the cash flow. So if you're looking at investing, everything comes down to the numbers, right? So at the end of the day, how much per week can you put to an, towards a property or another property? If that number is $200, $1,000 a week, what is that number? And then when you're speaking to your expert around property, after all the expenses, does that align with the property? So location is everything and we can talk about location in different cities, but that's hugely important and your timing to get in. So right now the timing is opportunity because most people are starting to get scared, right? If you if you can get your mindset around that, there's actually going to be a lot of opportunities to enter the market in the next six to 12 months. Yeah, incredible. And for you know, for my next question that I did have regarding some obstacles for first home owners, um, I know we discussed a few of them, but I have another question as well that I think of it would be, you know, do you have any tips for those out there saving for their first home? How do you have any tips regarding saving? Like how does one put together, you know, such a large deposit? Because I know 
five to 10% can be a good amount. Um, so yeah, do you have any tips regarding saving for a first home, getting that deposit? Yeah, so I would I would recommend actually sitting down and going through everything that you really spend. Yeah. Like truly actually spend to every detail and then highlighting and grouping things. So basically looking at what are things that you don't really, they're not necessities, they're just desirable, right? And I would suggest cutting back all desirables. So it's like it will instant, you know, giving up instant gratification for a massive long-term gain, right? And you can't see that because you're so used to like that every day or every week buying something online, getting that hit of dopamine. But if you can do the like knuckle down as soon as you can, as soon as you can and go through your numbers, work out what you can cut back and start saving, that is the biggest thing. So tips for savings would be to like cut back on things that you don't necessarily need, even like Uber Eats. $5 $5 every time you get Uber Eats instead of walking across the road and picking it up or going for a walk and getting it or driving to pick it up. That's a huge saving, cutting down Uber Eats. Um, also, like cutting down on um, things like drinking, you know, how much you're drinking. Think about what you're drinking. Cocktails are so bloody expensive now. Literally. Like $20 a cocktail, $18 to $25 a cocktail on a weekend out, like just cutting that to a different type of beverage or how many you have is huge savings, cutting down on online shopping um, and looking at where you can make savings around that, then looking at how you can do small types of um, roundup saving. You know, I know ING Bank has a roundup savings account, so it'll round up your spending and save it for you. And then there's apps like Raise where you can round up your spending into investments. Um, I would I would strongly just say the biggest thing is looking at how you can upskill, you know, and earn extra money as well. Like a lot of a lot of my clients in the past, we've always talked about how can they upskill in their current role to earn more money as well, right? Mm-hmm. Don't think about that. So like shifting your mind into income generating mindset. Mm-hmm. How can I be more useful, productive? Where can I make money, sell old clothes, sell old things that I have? Huge things that you can do to make money. Yeah, adds up. Love that. And looking ahead, what do you think will be the biggest challenges and opportunities facing first-time buyers in the investment property field? How can they best prepare themselves for those challenges and opportunities uh, coming up in the industry? Uh, biggest challenge for young people is going to be affordability. That yeah. is going to be the biggest challenge because it is going like right now it is really difficult for people to get into the market because of borrowing power and income. Okay, so there are strategies that you can use where you can um, potentially use equity in your parents' property um towards your deposit to help you get into the property market as well there's a few different little strategies but I think most people need that that affordability will be an issue the government needs to create more incentives for investors to buy so that that helps the rental affordability because we have a major supply shortage major supply shortage so unless something is done about that the property prices are still going to continue to rise so rents are going to continue to rise. So until, yeah, affordability, harder to get in. So young people need to start thinking about saving their money sooner, like very, very young, to sort of by the time they get in their 20s or 30s, they actually have the deposits. But the sooner you start, the sooner you can get in. And then the more skills you can provide, upskilling, I think the other thing that we're going to see is that technology is going to be, you know, AI is going to be a massive factor in in a lot of jobs. So, again, I I keep going back to that upskilling. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And as much as the future is hard to predict, I know you've done your time in terms of all the property cycles, but... Do you have a rough time frame in terms of how much longer the economy is going to kind of be the way that it is in terms of property continuing to increase and price of rent and the cost of living? Um, do you see like an end date? Is it only going to continue increasing for quite some time? Like, do you have any kind of insight regarding what your thoughts are that in regards yeah. to that? 
I have a lot of insights on my thoughts <laughs> on that. Um, but look, it's there's a lot of things happening globally right now, you know, with the US dollar, um, with the Chinese market. There's so many factors and the wars and things that actually affect the economy, right? Um, in terms of Australia, I feel like we're always kind of about six months behind the US. My personal opinion um, is is that we're going to see interest rates continue to rise a little bit more. I know they've been put on hold, but at the moment we're still not sitting at where we probably should be. So I think that they're going to rise somewhat more to around that six and a half percent rate. You know, after after the discounts on for you know on the home buyers' point of view. But then what I'm, I think is going to happen is we're going to have a few issues around supply. So if the interest rates rise, less people buy, right? It's less affordable. But that means we're not actually selling or building properties because what's happening now is you're going to see developers start to go under. There's like some companies that already have builders going under, things like this as the price of rates and expenses keeps rising according to inflation. So if that happens, we're not going to see new supply hit the market, which means that there's going to be another problem that the government is going to face. And what generally happens is you'll have these rise, rise, rise. And this is what happened with the GFC. They just went bang, 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 too fast. And then everything just went stupid. And then they had to come back in and go ship, drop the rates again. So if they don't factor all of that in and go a few more times, there will probably be another like flatline and then they might drop again. So I think the next 12 months is going to be really interesting in the property space. I've said to all of my clients and I continue to say to anyone that asks me, do not like expect the rates to go up. Like you just need to understand that the rates are already too low. Standard like good economy, we're sitting at like 7%. We're not even there yet, okay? We've just got so used to low rates, which is not normal. 7% was normal, average, strong economy. So I do believe the interest rate will, will continue. I think that property in the right locations will still be in high demand. But what will happen when interest rates continue to rise is in properties or pro- areas in those lower socioeconomic areas will be impacted, right? The less income people earn per household, those households, those areas will always be impacted first. And that's why we always look at blue chip because you've got, you know, high income areas. So property will probably stabilise. Some areas may drop. um, But overall, our economy in Australia is supported by a number of things and the shortage that we have at the moment. But the media will always grab those sad stories and push it out. But remember, property is so different in different areas, different locations. What one area does doesn't mean that that's happening in every area. Yeah, I love that. So interesting. What do you think sets, think sets successful investors apart from those who struggle to generate returns? And how can young investor, investors cultivate these qualities? So, um, w- yeah, what success, what's... Wow, this is a tongue twister. <laughs> what do you think sets successful investors? That is a tongue twister apart from those who struggle to generate returns. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? I think, you know, anyone that's successful in anything usually has guidance and support and the right team of experts around them, right? Mm-hmm. The right team is like you've got the right finance people behind you, you've got the right solicitor, the right accountant, the right property advisor, you know, so this is your team of experts. And like being successful in any way, in any field, you have a team. If you don't, you're just not saying you're not successful, but you may not be as successful. You may make more mistakes in the process and it may take you longer. So that's probably what sets people apart, you know, mentors, guides, and the team of people behind you. I think the other thing is like timing, a successful person in investing has always got timing better, right? They're willing to sell at the right time, buy at the right time, hold at the right time, okay? Mm-hmm. And cash flow, you know, they really understand their cash flow so they're not like forced to make stupid decisions at the wrong time. 
Yeah, totally. And with that as well, why would you say property is so beneficial? Like why would you encourage people to get into the markets, investing in properties? Uh, What makes it so great? So I love all types of investment because (laughs) I think that if you're making your money work for you, then that's what you need to do, right? So I'm not like just only property, but I am a prop like more experienced in property than any other form of investment. And this is what I live and breathe. Uh, property is a really good investment because you can um, get an income back from that property at the same time as holding it. So you've got rental income that comes in to support paying off the asset. So you're not paying 100% of the investment, right? You can leverage your investment by borrowing money from the bank. So if you've got 100,000, 60,000, you're not just investing 100,000, right? You're now getting a loan and you're potentially investing 600,000, right? So 600,000 over 10 years is going to make you more money potentially than 100,000 over you get what I'm saying? So that's the leverage that you can do in property and you can also get tax benefits depending on your type of income structure. So In Australia, you also get a tax rebate if you have a negative on the property, meaning the outgoings cost more than the income. So there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You can get a tax advantage on that. So I think property is a really good, um, easy, it's brick and mortar. People like can see it, you know, they understand it a bit more. And it's it's just a really good way to build, you know, equity and, and gives you opportunities to do other things, you know. Yeah, definitely. And I know you chatted a little bit before in regards to rent investing, and I wanted to touch on that a little bit more because I know a lot of people are like, you know, always asking the question, oh, do you live in your property or like, what do you mean you're just renting type thing, you know? So can you tell us a little bit about what rent investing is and why it is so great and the benefits behind it and why it could even be better to rent invest instead of just living in one of your properties? Yeah, so rent investing is basically where you rent where you want to live and you can afford to live and you invest where you can afford to invest. So basically a lot of people can afford to rent in a house or property that they really want to live in a location they really want to live, but for them to buy that property and live in it would cost way more than actually renting. Okay, so it's giving you the desire of where you want to be as opposed to then buying where you can afford to buy. So let's say you can only afford to buy something for 500000 but they that might not be where. So it might be in a different city because it's better, maybe in a different location, or it might be smaller than what you need, right? You might have kids and you need a five-bedroom house, but you can't buy that five-bedroom house. The other benefit of rent vesting is that the cost per week to rent vest depending on where we are so like you know when we were when we were buying properties and doing numbers when the interest rates were like three percent it was positive gear it did not cost you anything to have a you know six hundred and fifty thousand dollar property while someone else was living it might cost you two hundred dollars a week after this is after body corps rates water insurance management fees everything versus living in the same property it would cost you maybe a thousand eight fifty per week to a thousand so basically the difference is is that it, it gives you where you want to live plus an investment property for less than just going out and buying the property to live in. So it, it gives you the ability to have the freedom and lifestyle as well. So you can just be like, oh, I want to go overseas for three months. Sweet, I'm just going to go do that, move out of my property. Or my job changed and I can't afford the rent. Cool, I'm going to go to a cheaper property. I'm going to move further out. So you're less locked in and you have a bit of that freedom. So most of my clients could afford multiple properties under rent vesting versus just living in one place and trying to pay that off. Yeah. So there's heaps and heaps of benefits, but rent vesting is not for everyone. And like at the end of the day, I'm not here to tell people this is how you have to do it. It's more like what is it that you want to do? And as long as you know all of the ins and outs, you make that decision based on what's best for you. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Particularly 
as a young person who you know does want to travel and experiment different living in different areas as well seeing what you like is that's kind of how I look at it as well for me and why it would be beneficial for me just to keep renting is just the fact that I every single six to 12 months I want to try to get a even though I do love the Gold Coast, but living in a different area, maybe, heck, we'll go even go to Brisbane and we'll like yourself, you go to Sydney, Melbourne, everywhere, go traveling as well. So yeah, I love that. And just educating people and say, actually, you know, it's, there's actually some method behind the madness. Um, now, next question is, should we be worried about interest rates um, this is something I always get asked every time I have ever talked about property. It's like, are you scared about interest rates? So can you tell us as an expert, should we be worried? I think I kind of answered this earlier, but basically, as I said, interest rates are not even where they normally are in a good economy. So am I worried about interest rates? No. <laughs> should people be worried about interest rates? Well, yeah, they should be worried in the sense of like, not worried, but you should be aware of your costs. So like like last year, we um, anyone that was buying like properties, I was always doing the numbers based on the rates being higher than they are now. Yeah. So like most people now should actually look at what would their repayment be if the interest rate was 7% or mm -hmm. 6.5%. What's that difference? And actually start putting that in the loan now set up an automatic payment like so it's not a surprise you know you don't open the letter and you're like shit you know it's like I'm already paying what it should be yeah. so that's my opinion I mean um, there will be a number of people that have not thought about you know these interest rate rises or that they will rise and they would have maybe potentially gone out and got other loans that's where I would be worried if you've got a number of what I call unsecured loans, like car loans, credit cards, personal loans, they're the ones that will make you suffer on the loan because you've got too many like parts to pay, right? So if you are worried about interest rates, I would suggest getting like a review done because yeah, we're offering that at the moment. Um, but, you know, at any time, if anyone wants a review to see if there's better rates, because there's so many banks out there, you can get a better deal. And also look at if there are other loans, I would 100% look at combining them into one loan so it's easier to manage. But yeah, there's things that you can do. But know that interest rates are going to go up, but that doesn't mean that's just normal. Like this is the mindset component that I was talking about before. Yeah, I love that. Amazing. And I know we've chatted a lot and the audience has already gotten an amazing insight in terms of how beneficial having a mentor can be. But can you tell us some more in insight in regards to why is a mentor so important and what are some other areas? I know you chatted a little bit about money mindset as well that you can help with. So why is having a mentor so beneficial? Um, so basically, like with my experience, you know, we provide the mentorship in, in finance, property and business as well, right? The reason it's so beneficial is you're learning from other people that are like living and breathing this every single day. That's what they do, right? And you're not only like going to an expert with that, you're also getting all the knowledge, experience, lessons, things that they've done that are on parted to you. So again, it's fast tracking your success and it's getting the experience, knowledge and guidance. You know, another part of mentorship is often, and this is, I believe this in every mentor, every industry, often we can't see in ourselves what we're capable of. It takes someone else to see and, and to give us that encouragement that we can achieve what we want to achieve. And I think that's where a mentor comes in. Yeah, I love that. And an analogy I like to say as well for my clients and as well, it'd be the same for you is just the fact that like it's, you know, your 20 years of experience, more than that, uh, bundled up in a pretty little gift with a bow on top. Just like here it is. Here are the mistakes. Here's everything, you know, just right there. You know, you've done the hard yards and, you know, you're so invested in the industry that you can just be like, yep, this is 
it, you know, any questions that I have, you know, I'm what's happening you. Um, and it's just bundled up with a bow. It's like, I, I, I know I would pay an arm and a leg to have certain information delivered to me in a way that's easier and going to save me time because time is money and we're all busy people. So having a mentor for me is just incredibly important in every single field ever. Um, now- I think also just like knowing someone's got your back that's yeah. like working for you. You know what I mean? Like in your industry, in my industry, there's so many people telling you different things. You're like, I don't know what's true. Mm-hmm. And what am I supposed to do? Is that person telling me? So it's like, you know, you've just got someone that's got your back, right? Yeah, totally. hundred percent. And sometimes we can even have thoughts that come up. They're like, oh, you know, like maybe a little bit of a limiting, limiting belief or like maybe second guessing ourselves and then, you know, throwing that on the table, be like, hey, what are you? and then having that second set of eyes to pull us into place and slap some sense in us when we kind of get a little bit, bit overwhelmed and in, in a field that we're not experts in helps so much. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I would love to know, can you tell us what's next for you? I know you're a busy gal and you've always got a million things on your plate. So what's some exciting things we can be seeing from you over the next couple of years? Yeah, so for me, um, lots lots more property development, um, you know, doing some really exciting projects um, outside of what we're already doing now, but sort of like trying to push the boundaries and things like, um, you know, doing like we've got like a rural property at the moment um, that we're doing in the back of the scenic rim where we're going to be developing like a whole community. Sustainability is a really big one for me, like, being fully sustainable properties that don't rely on the grid, don't rely on anything like farming. Everything is all within the village and a little community that we're building out there. Um, Looking at like boutique hotels is something that's really on the radar at the moment, um, all over my boards at the moment. (laughs) So we're in the works of um, kind of out, out building the little mini boutique hotels that we're, we're looking at, but again, providing them with an edge something that's different um, and yet yeah, for me looking at more international expansion which I've already done in Asia but looking at more um, when I talk about international expansion of really bringing you know the education and and experience into other sectors in the world and um, maybe a podcast I know I've, I've really yes. wanted to do this <laughs> for so long do but it. it's like you know, with so much knowledge in different areas, it's kind of hard to knuckle down what is it going, what's the message, but I think I'm just <laughs> going to be like my thoughts and my experience on oh, everything. Yeah, it would be so good. Honestly, you have to because, yeah, every single podcast you could do a different topic and you could oh, do it, please. <laughs> um, and then lastly, probably just running more workshops, so whether it's like big business workshops, more property workshops and um, education, a lot of education platforms there as well Mm, workshops are amazing I always attend them so I would highly recommend everyone to go join them um well that's amazing do you have anything else you wanted to touch on in today's episode to wrap up no I just wanted to say thank you for having me thank you for trusting me and I'm so excited to see where you land (laughs) because I'm just like pumped constantly seeing your growth and yeah just like you know hoping everyone's got some really good insights from from this podcast that will help them and um yeah if they want to reach out can jump on my instagram which is just a y d a s h a b a n z so ida shabans which i'm sure you're going to tag up um and our website which is growgroup.com.au amazing thank you so much i will link ida's instagram and all her details down below so thank you everyone so much for listening and we will see you guys in the next episode thanks